Welcome to the Recruiting Stories Podcast, where we celebrate recruiting by exploring the stories of leaders and top performers by digging into their stories and understanding how recruiting has impacted their journey and their success. Are you a leader or do you want to be a leader? If so, this episode is for you. Our guest on this week's episode of the Recruiting Stories podcast is Nathan Magnuson. Nathan is a professional leadership consultant. And guess what leaders have to do? They have to recruit people. Check out our conversation. I think you're going to really enjoy it. We're going to talk about how recruiting impacted his story and his thoughts on recruiting and some tips that he might have as a leadership consultant who works with people all over the country and uh, how you might implement some of those insights into how you recruit and uh, into your leadership expertise as well. All right, welcome to another edition of the Recruiting Stories podcast powered by Cover 3 Consulting. Uh, Today, our guest is Nathan Magnuson. Nathan, welcome to the show, man. Hey, thanks for having me, Adrian. Yeah, I'm thrilled to have Nathan. So Nathan and I actually, we go back pretty far, oddly enough. Um, Nathan, um, I'm, I'm connected and, and really good friends with, uh, his younger brother. And, uh, so we, we met years back, uh, kind of, you know, uh, in, in passing. I remember we were just talking about the Chiefs offline here. Uh, I think we went to a preseason game. And I remember like throwing the football in the parking lot for, uh, for a good bit of time, but who knew we would be here today talking about business and leadership and recruiting. So I'm uh, excited about it. So Nathan, uh, he's an author. He's an entrepreneur. Uh, he's a veteran. Um, he owns Leadership in a Box, uh, which is a consulting company. Um, af- and he's done that after years of being in the corporate world, jumping out and being an entrepreneur uh, on his own. So I'm looking forward to digging in and, and learning a little bit about his story. So would you mind giving us just like an overview, Nathan, on some of your background? Yeah, Adrian. So I think I'm, I think I'm like in my fourth career at this point, uh, but who's counting, right? So uh, I remember graduated from college, starting off a role in accounting and just right from the start. And it is, this is not a good fit for me. It, I couldn't get excited about it. And uh, apparently if you're creative, you know, like that's bad in accounting that you'll go to jail <laughs> for being a creative in accounting. So uh, from there, I, I needed to find a way to uh, get into a new field. I ended up joining the army and I uh, was in the army for a while. And I, and I used, the education benefit to go to grad school was able to kind of get into my dream field, which was corporate leadership development. And so worked there for about 11 years at a few different of the fortune 500 organizations. And then about two years ago, kind of mid pandemic, I took that leap of faith and said, Hey, I want to see if I can do this on my own. And so kind of just about two years strong at this point. That's awesome. Very cool. Well, congrats on making the jump. Um, as someone who's done it himself, it's uh, exciting and scary and uh, the best thing uh, I've ever done. So, you know, that's awesome. <laughs> I, 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 can, I concur. I concur. <laughs> right. Yeah, especially with the, yeah, I mean, COVID and, you know, where we're at now, there's all sorts of ups and downs. So, um, but yeah, I want to dive back. I want to dive back into kind of how you got there, why you went into entrepreneurship. But I also want to learn a little bit about your recruiting story here, too. So, you know, you mentioned like the military as something, you know, coming out of college, right? Yeah, yeah, it was it was after my first job after college when things weren't working out. And I had to just think, what kind of spaghetti can I throw on the wall to rearrange the, the picture here? And that's what yeah. came up. Cool. Well, so that so you said, OK, military seems like an option. Now, was that because, you know, um, hey, they're going to pay for something or I know I met somebody. Tell me a little bit about how you ended up there and how that kind of set you off in your trajectory. I'll tell you. But can I tell you like a really quick, funny story uh, sure, first, yeah. Adrian? So my brother now, you're, you're, you're friends with my brother. That's how we're connected. Um, he's got another friend we were just hanging out with uh, for the Super Bowl, actually. Go Chiefs. But uh <clears throat> This guy joined the army back in the day, right? As a as a young man, and the 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 story is pretty funny because he said, uh, 
you know, they're, they're going to Fort Benning, you know, infantry school. And, you know, they tell everyone on the bus, all right, we're going to be at the infantry school in like 30 minutes. So like, get ready to go basically. And, and he turns to the guy next to him is like, like, what's infantry school? <laughs> and the guy is like, it's for all the infantry guys. Like that's the school for us. And he's like, what do you mean infantry? He's like, you're infantry. That's your job. And he said, isn't everyone infantry? <laughs> he's like, no, there's like a hundred different jobs. And when you talk to your recruiter, your recruiter helped you pick the job, right? It's like, my recruiter just said I'm infantry. I thought everyone was infantry. <laughs> <laughs> and so you're like, oh my gosh. Well, now for the next six years, you're going to be doing your infantry thing. And the recruiter is going to be back there, like trying to hit his targets, right? So it's funny, especially now yep. that he's an engineer and just doing really great things now. But that, that was very opposite of my approach. You know, I was, <laughs> I was in this accounting job, didn't like it, but didn't have any money. I knew that I wanted to be in leadership development, but there wasn't like a great path to go from this guy's uh, not that good accountant. But now let's get him a leadership development job. So I, I knew I probably had to go to grad school for that didn't have money for grad school. So just kind of looked at the options and said, okay, military could get me there. Um, but then like, I'd never thought about being in the military before. And so I, I looked, uh, unlike our friend, right? I, I looked at all of the jobs. <laughs> you did your said, research, actually. Yeah. I said, here's one job in the special ops that it looks like it might allow me to use my business education in a way that um, it can be a meaningful contribution for me, but also, you know, I don't want to be in the military long term. It's kind of like a stepping stone, but it, it can actually be as good of a fit as it could be for me for that uh, point in time and then help me along where I'm trying to go. So um, that, that's kind of how I approached it. Well, yeah, you definitely definitely were more detailed and thoughtful, it sounds like, than than your buddy, which uh, there's a whole recruiting lesson in and of itself right there, right? It's like, don't just blindly trust the recruiter, right? Like, make sure you ask a lot of the right questions uh, and, and figure out exactly what you're going to be doing. Yeah, um, exactly. So that's great. That's awesome. Very cool. So, so you were in there. And so, um, and so you served like a full term. Did you deploy or anything like that? Yeah, the first thing they told us when we went to our special ops school is, hey, you guys are going to Iraq uh, soon. So it's exactly what happened. I spent most of 2008 over there in northern Iraq. And uh, and it kind of worked exactly how I, well, as much as I can say, as much as I thought it would. I, I got on an economic development team with our special ops group working with the State Department. And, um, you know, it's it's... There's a lot of dynamics of not just military, but politics and all of, you know, that mission that we don't have time for. And honestly, I don't even un still don't even understand everything that went into all of it. But uh, but but I did get to use my bed, my business education, did get to come back and uh, finish up grad school in a bad economy, too, because uh 2007, 2008 is where things got, got really bad. And so yeah. I came back and I said, I'm going to get, I'm going to get a job and I'll do, um, grad school part time. Well, they weren't just giving out jobs, you know, it was right. there's a lot of places had a hiring freeze. So I said, well, I guess I'm going to school full time then. And I was fortunate enough to, uh, get into a big consulting company doing leadership development right after that. And I honestly don't think it was because. I was such a great candidate, but like they needed bodies and I was in the right place at the right time. And so, so, so some of that is being in the right place at the right time is yeah. being available is more important than being like that top candidate. Sometimes I really feel like. I used to have a football coach who would tell me like, um, you know, you can't, you can't make the club in the tub is what he would say. Meaning <laughs> like, yeah. You you can't make the team. You can't be on the field and compete and win with with us if you're always um, injured, right? Or if you're if you're not available, as you just said. And so uh, he was basically making the point like you got to be on the field. You got to be available when your when your number is called. So I agree with that advice for sure. Um, so I want to loop back just a little bit too. So you've you, you know you you are in leadership development that's something that like you yeah. are passionate about and um 
how did that become a thing for you? Like, what were there anyone that inspired you there? Like a certain leader or a book you read? What, where did that come from? Well, I'm one of those lucky people, Adrian, where um, I remember where I was sitting in class my second semester senior year in my organizational leadership class. And the professor, he was right in the middle of explaining the difference between a vision and a mission and a plan. And it's okay. just like lightning hit me. And I was, mm-hmm. and I said, and I realized like, I've always been thinking this way. I just didn't know it. And I said, I don't know what they call these jobs in companies, but I want one. Yeah. And it took me five years to finally find, you know, finally get my first one. But I was fortunate enough that, uh, you know, kind of that inspiration struck. And then I, I didn't know how to get there. I just knew I need to head in this direction. Great. Yeah. And uh, um, so I believe there's opportunity for everyone. I believe that not every there's not like one specific single thing everyone's supposed to do. I mean, my career has definitely been a journey and there's going to be more twists and turns as I go. Um, same as I think with everyone, but, um, you know, having that sense of direction early on has definitely been an asset. Yeah. That's super helpful. I mean, you know, I always say I'm, I'm envious of the people who are like, I knew I was going to be a medical doctor from like the time I was five years old. And I was like, good for you. Like, that was not my story at all. Like, I had to go all different directions and figure out what to do. So, yeah, but but Adrian, to that point, though, uh, my college roommate um, is a medical doctor now. He's a, mm. a cardiologist, but he played baseball in college. And that had kind of been the thing that he wanted to do his whole life was be mm. a baseball player. But he realized um, in college after two years of playing, like I don't have what it takes to make it at that level. And I'm just going to say it now. And so he decided, look, well, my fallback is like, let's see if I can try to be a doctor. So he ended up quitting the baseball team, even though he's good enough to be on that college team. Like that was going to be his ceiling. He said, let me, uh, I'm going to quit playing baseball. I'm going to pick up the extra classes, like the hard classes, you know, all the anatomy and physiology and biology and all this. Like, they don't just let anyone be, be doctors, right. <laughs> thankfully. That's good. Yeah. And, and also, uh, <coughs> became the, the, uh, junior class president. And then the next year, the student body president. But I, I, 10 years later, I I hung out with him and he had finally at that point, like the week before he got his first big boy check of like Mm. all the extra schooling he had to do. And he told me, Nathan, like I love doing this. He said, like, I love, then like, I like the hard surgeries, the ones that like no one wants to touch because it'll mess up their record. If it goes wrong, like those are the ones I enjoy most. Mm. And he told me, he said, I used to think, that playing baseball was like the one path for me. And if I didn't make it, I'd be living a consolation life. You know, and I asked him, I said, Luke, um, let me ask you a question. I said, do you think you're enjoying the work you do now as much as you would have enjoyed playing pro baseball if you had made it? And he's like, daggone it. I think I actually enjoyed this more than I would have enjoyed that. So it's crazy how that works out. Like, People who say there's one path for me, I think that can limit them more than it can yes. help them sometimes because there's so much more yes. available than most of us have even thought of. And I think that's such a great point. I, I you know, I talk to people all the time and, and you know, they're, I think, you know, uh, singular focuses uh, can be good in moments. Um, but, you know, having tunnel vision sometimes, uh, especially when it comes to careers, I think is a bad idea um, because, like to your point with your friend, I mean, um, had they not lifted their head up and said, Hey, you know what? I might be good at something else. Let me just see. Let me test it out. You know what? If you would have gotten to those classes in the first year or two after that and was like, I hate this, that would have been okay. Cause then you could have done something else. Right. Yeah. But it turns out he loved it. And now he's, he's obviously good at it too. Um, because he, he was willing, he was willing to let another d- dream die. It sounds like. Well, and also, Adrian, this is gonna this is gonna be way deep, but there's there are a lot of people who are afraid of success. Like mm-hmm. everyone's afraid of failure to some degree, but some people are afraid of success because it it could upset the plan that they kind of already have in mind. Yeah, and that's just hard to deal with sometimes. It's like we like structure, we like having a plan, and if, if it gets upset, even if the outcome would be better, 
like it messes up our sense of control and our sense of like expectation. Uh, it, it can be hard to deal with sometimes. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Well, so tell me then. We're going to go back to your path a little bit here. So, as you jumped into, um, you know, consulting with some of the big companies, and you did that for a little bit, uh, a little while. I know healthcare was part of that, and then, um, but then at some point you said, "Hey, also, I want to. I think I might want to do this on my own." Was there anyone um, specifically there who kind of inspired you or recruited you into that world of saying, "Hey, I want to be on my own," or or how did you end up there? No, honestly, Adrian, I can't say that there is. It's just enough of just look, taking my experiences into account, looking down the road at where that could lead if I choose path one, path two, or path three, but also just looking in the mirror and asking myself, like, what do I do best? What do I like the most? What do people need and what will they pay for? And it just, you know, kind of like doing a personal inventory of what I've got to give. Like I can, that's one of those things when you're right out of school, you're fresh, man, you need it. You just need a job. You're starting from scratch. Whereas, you know, you've been doing this long enough. You've been in a, in a field for 10 years to be able to say, these are the things I like most. These are the things I do best. I could do several jobs within the field, but which one is the best fit for me? And it, and it just seemed like I can make the, biggest contribution if I'm doing it for myself instead of at corporate. At corporate, I can only help one organization at a time and I do a wide variety of projects. But on my own, I can pick the projects I want to work on, but then support a wide variety of organizations who really need that stuff. So I wouldn't wish entrepreneurship on uh, (laughs) everyone, but it's one of those things where you know, it was important for me to take a leap of faith and just kind of see, um, you know, we're two years in at this point and it's going well. We had this conversation already. It's like mountains and valleys on the same day sometimes, but um, it's been so rewarding. And I feel like I'm actually helping more people this way, which is what it's all about. So I love that. That's cool. Yeah. And sometimes I think that's the best uh, really, I mean, that's the best thing that you can do when you think about your career, right? Is, is doing that personal inventory and saying, okay, where, you know, what impact do I want to have? What are the outcomes that I want? And what's the vehicle that's going to get me there? And it might be a corporate job. It might be a small business. It might be a nonprofit organization. It might be, I'm an entrepreneur. Um, but you don't know until you actually run that inventory and kind of decide. Um, what's going to be the best vehicle for me. So and it doesn't sure. just have to be one thing the whole yeah. way through. You know, I, like I said, I'm on my fourth career at this point. Um, but uh, yeah, I think we, we need to be stewards of our own talent. Yeah. Well, I've always told everyone, um, you know, that uh, nobody cares about my career and my success as much as I do. And so, you know, that's, that's part of why I started my own business too, is I had a lot of people who actually even, cared about me in a pretty big way for some of the organizations that I worked with, but their ability to uh, help grow my skill set and um, aptitude and help me to go where I believed I was capable of going. The only one that was going to help me take that to the limit was myself. And so that's why I made a similar decision. So completely understand, completely understand. But I've seen some people who they've got a situation where um, their organization will support that goal. I mean, I think of your your friend who's, uh, you know, a surgeon, you know, cardiologist or, or what have you. And that may be a case where it's like, man, there's probably someone there who said, hey, here's a ladder. Here's a process. Here's a place you, that you can go. And uh, I've seen that happen for multiple people as well. So, well, cool. So, okay. So you work with um, lots of different companies around the country. Um on, on leadership here. And so obviously a big part of leadership is recruiting, right? Like that's, that's a part of it. So do you have like your own, uh, I guess, recruiting philosophy uh, that you kind of talk with? Because I'm sure you talk with leaders about this is a part of the problems that they go through. So tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, I have. Well, I have a few things, um, Adrian. The first one is just always be recruiting. Um, and And you would, I know you would be the first one to say this, but uh, recruit whether you have a role open or not. You know, if, if you're the leader, um, you need to just always, always be recruiting. 
Uh, I have, I remember, man, this was years down the road when I was finishing up grad school. I had a little, I did a little summer job at the Chick-fil-A. This, this was after I did my army, my army duty after I'd been an accountant, you know, uh, I did a little summer at Chick-fil-A and, uh, and, but one day, like, I just had to have a burger. So I went over to Wendy's and in the drive through and there's this young lady who was quick, courteous, um, just like everything you would want in someone, you know, who worked in that environment. And I said, uh, <laughs> I had to get aggressive. I said, here's my number. Like, you're what we're looking for. Like, if you ever looking for something different, you call me, even though I knew we didn't have a role open. Like I need people on the list so that when we need someone, we're not starting from scratch. We're already (laughs) picking, you know, from, from the top. So the first thing I say to people is, Hey, always be recruiting. It's always the right time uh, to be recruiting. Uh, Another thing that I say is uh, Adrian is, Watch out just for your personal biases in the recruiting process. And the and the biggest one that I've seen from myself as well as other folks is just the similar to me bias. It's is you think that um someone who's has a similarity the way I am is the right person for that role. And that actually relies on a pretty big assumption that I'm the right person for the job I already have, which is kind of actually a crazy assumption. Like how many people out there are in a job that's the best fit for them? I saw a statistic from time last year that said 65% of people are looking for different jobs. And like, can you imagine if all 65% found a different job, like 65% (laughs) turnover, like that would be nuts. Uh, So so we've got to resist thinking that someone who has the same personality, someone who approaches problems in the same manner, uh, someone who um, just is, is similar to me, that doesn't necessarily mean they're the right fit. That could mean they're the wrong fit. I actually have a funny story about this one too, Adrian. I, I remember I was at the same old Chick-fil-A. I was at that Chick-fil-A for three months. I took a whole bunch of leadership lessons out of <laughs> there, awesome. but... I remember they had a group interview come in for like, I think they were going to hire like three people and they had like 10 or 12 people all sitting around in the circle. I remember one guy, he was just like a little bit too relaxed. Like he, he leaned back in his seat. He was just like, uh, he was funny. He was casual. And I got, I'm a pretty intense guy by nature, but I mean, this was, this was 14 years ago. So I was, mm-hmm. I was like, I don't know about that guy. You know, he's a, he just seems a little bit too chill. And then there was another guy that was like very intense. He was sitting up in his seat. He was like serious. He was asking a lot of questions, like kind of similar to me, like especially back then. And uh, they ended up hiring both of them. Like my, my advice was uh, first guy, no, the second guy, yes. They ended up hiring both of them. And let me tell you something, Adrian, the, the guy who was, the guy who was serious and was taking the process seriously, it was like deer in a headlights. Like you put him in the back making sandwiches and stuff together. Like this guy couldn't react. You know, he, mm-hmm. he was taking things too literal. He couldn't move in the moment. And like a couple of weeks in, they were like, he wasn't on the schedule anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He couldn't pull the weight. But the first guy, that guy would hop in. Hop, he was hopping and popping. He was moving. You could That's throw awesome. something at him. He'd figure it out. And, I just remember looking in the mirror and being like, I do not know what I'm doing from a recruiting right. standpoint. <laughs> like, I, I, sure. I, what I thought was exactly wrong. So how do I figure out how to get this right? And since then, Adrian, I've learned like you're never going to a hundred percent get recruiting. Right. But, uh, but that similar to me bias will mm-hmm. hurt you. Sure. Uh, Absolutely. More than it will help you. So just I try to always be as aware as possible. Like, do I like that person just because I see myself in them? Because if so, try to cancel that out and be more objective. No, I love that. I yeah, I think it's good because there's you know, there's there's something to be said for being like relatable. Everybody wants to work with someone they relate to, right? That's that's helpful. But that there's so many times when I, you know, there's a lot of people who are way better at certain things than I am. And that's a good thing, right? Well, yeah. um, it, we need people to complement our own abilities uh, rather than, um, you know, all do and be the exact same person. So that's great. 
Yeah, can, can I share another little a nugget that I've learned? This was just about the the importance of giving a realistic job preview. Sure. Yeah. So I remember, uh, I remember at my last corporate job when I needed to hire a trainer to join my team. And so just working with the recruiting team and, you know, they're trying to help me, uh, set the rec and set the expectation for candidates they're looking for. And, and that way they'll help screen out all the ones that are going to apply because everyone wants to be a trainer, leadership trainer signed me up. And so we end up getting tons of folks who have no qualification at all. (laughs) Um, but anyways, we, we found someone that I liked. And I remember just having the conversation with her to say like, Hey, here's, here's the great things about this job. Here's the doors that it can open up as you go. Here's how, you know, when I see your resume and here's how I think that this can help you personally. And, you know, she's, she's already excited. She's getting more excited about that. But, but then I said, look, I need to be upfront with you about some of the challenges too, you know, about, you know, the culture is a little difficult to deal with it sometimes like we have like a lot of scrutiny and kind of a lot of pressure on us where we work is actually kind of isolating so we would have to determine what's the culture we want for our two-person team so we have each other's back because Mm -hmm. we don't get the type of support that you would hope for in in this environment and i just like i need to tell you that up front so you know what you're walking into and part of me, I was like, I was afraid to tell her those things. I thought I might scare her off, but she went from excited to really excited. Like the more things I said, um, you need to watch out for her desire for that job went up. And I said, wait mm-hmm. a second, like what, what's going on here? I, I'm telling you a negative thing and you're getting more excited. And she, she blew my mind. She said, Nathan, the more you tell me, the more I feel like I can trust you ahead of time. Like you're not trying to sell me a bill of goods. You're you're setting me up for success. And even though we haven't worked together, my trust for you is growing as you're telling me both sides of the coin. And I just walked away thinking, oh man, we need to do more of this. Set the realistic expectation. Because how many of us have seen people who came into a job, it wasn't what they wanted. And two weeks in, they're already like, I've made a huge mistake. Yeah, hundred no. percent. Man, I I love that story so much because when, even and when I train my, some of my own recruiters, you know, or, or I'm training, you know, talking with and consulting with companies on their recruiting process, I, I'll always say something similar to that, and it's it's like honesty is one of your best recruiting tools, and it's exactly what you're saying. And and I, and because you know, if, if I say, hey, listen, the hours are, you know. I don't know, six, six to three every single day. Well, there's going to be some people who are like, that sounds terrible. I can't do that. And that is great because, you know, you're just, you're, you're attracting, um, who you want and you're, um, deflecting who you, who you don't want. And that's certain that that is, that's great. And that's, you know, I talk about leading with values, but, you know, and things like that, because if someone doesn't identify with your values and doesn't identify with, the mission of your organization, like be upfront and honest with those things early because, you know, you don't want somebody to walk in and suddenly be surprised that, you know, um, you're the type of company that uh, is really family focused or whatever, right? I don't know what the thing is, you know, value is, but like you want them to know this is what the job is and this is who we are. Uh, otherwise, oh no, two weeks in, like you said, now I'm now I'm stuck here. I'm <laughs> That's good. Exactly. That's good advice. Are you- I've been in that situation before where I, two weeks in, I'm like, this is not, this is going to be painful. As long as this lasts, this is going to be painful. And, uh, and it would have been better for everyone if we had figured out how to be more realistic up front instead of finding out after the fact. So, uh, it's bad for the person, but it's bad for the organization because you have someone that now is never going to really going to be committed and then they're eventually going to leave. And now you're just right back where you started again. You got to recruit for this open role. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, it, at least uh, at least you knew what you were getting into um, with the infantry, right? Like you knew what you knew what you were doing. <laughs> yeah. so I wasn't in the infantry. Yeah, that, one, that wasn't gonna happen. That's right. That's right. That's right. I did my homework on that one. <laughs> that's your sure. part. Uh, that's fine. Uh, yeah. So okay. So um, that said. Any other tips that you can think of for for folks who are are recruiting or as leaders um, who will be hiring? Um, and building teams of any sort? Well, I have 
I have I have one more that comes to mind, which is just to be be a talent developer as opposed to a talent hoarder. And so, like we have leaders sometimes, you know, I've, I've worked with a lot of them that will think if I can just get enough of the right good people on my team, then I'm set, and nobody can touch them because they're mine. Yeah, and uh, yeah. I encourage people to say, "Hey, um, they're not your people. <laughs> like you have them on your team for this point in time, but but you got to steward their talent the same way you need to steward your own talent. And hoarding them will only stunt their growth. And I, I get it when you don't want to let people go out back into the real world. You definitely don't want people going to work. Good people working for your competitors, but but even internally like if someone stays in the company but they go to someone else's team like we want to do that and if we if we're the type of leader that can develop talent then that means we've already got other people in the pipeline ready to take those jobs and like we're growing the organization's talent but that means we've got to be willing to uh send them on to bigger and better things when it's the right time instead of keeping them there longer than they should and uh, yeah, it's just, it's a stewardship responsibility. I, I, I feel real strongly that that's, that is a leader's, one of the leader's responsibilities. One of the greatest ones is to steward the talent on your team, not just your own. Now you're a leader mm-hmm. of people. You need to steward the talent that is in your inventory. And that means the good ones need to move on and move up. And then that opens up an opportunity to bring the other ones in at the lower level and just keep that development cycle going. Uh, easy to say, hard to do, but like leadership's hard. So that's, that's yeah. the job. Well, yeah, it makes me think of like, you know, is you want somebody, who, you want talented people who are inspired towards a mission and a goal, but the moment that they feel held captive, suddenly that dynamic changes, right? You're not working towards something together. I feel like I'm bound to something. And then and that's an unhealthy environment all of a sudden. Uh, you, you think of, sports environment you know there's easy examples um you know sports but it's like it wouldn't make sense if you're like okay we've got a few um you know all pro athletes here and we are never letting them go ever and it's like well yeah you could hold on to them but you'd have to pay them all right and then you wouldn't have any supporting cast around them and then if you're not winning nobody's happy then all of a sudden like you know the ship that was here is just is going downhill it doesn't make any sense to do that so um I love that uh, example. It's like, how, how do we support, um, you know, developing that talent um, and kind of holding it with an open hand rather than a closed fist? That's good. Adrian, so so it's easier for me to talk to um, recruiting tips for leaders. Um, but I came up with a couple for for actual recruiters. And so sure, I'm sure. Like, by you and, and you're the one who's the recruiter. So tell me if these are good because you're the expert in this. <laughs> But the first one is was for re- people who are in recruiting to share ownership instead of just accepting the ownership for recruiting. In other words, make it a point to say recruiting is all of our responsibility and I will be the lead person, but you have a role too. Because I remember it's easy to talk about recruiting, but when I had a rec open up the first time and I officially got to work with the team, I, I saw different dynamics than I had before. And it's where it really hit home for me that that recruiter is my partner, but like, this is my job to get yes. the right person on my team. Right. And that's too much work to just expect, go out and find me someone who's a good fit. Like that, that's my job and they help me with my job. And so mm-hmm. I wonder how many recruiters, I'm sure a lot of them would think that, but how many of them proactively push that message to the people they support that we're partners and I'm your talent acquisition partner, but like, this is our collective responsibility. I just, I know that, um, I remember thinking that to myself, but one of my takeaways was these recruiters need to be pushing this back on me and on these other people, because that's a much more realistic expectation. No, I think I think you're 100 percent right. I mean, I think you know that, um, you know, especially the right fit for the right role. Typically, that's a needle in a haystack, no matter where mm-hmm. what the role. There's certain qualifications. There's certain, you know, um, 
you know, mission and, and values and time frame and compensation, all these things, all these different factors that go into finding the right person for the right role. Um, the healthiest organizations that I see, the ones that you talked about, people want to work for and people are being developed and, and they're, they're on mission together and they're excited to be that the morale is really good. Well, typically, well, that's what you find. You find a team environment where it's in, hey, let's get the best team together. Like, let's go together. Let's go find someone else who can jump in here and help us succeed, right? Um, and from from my standpoint, so I'm, you know, we're a third party recruiting agency. If I ever run into an organization and like they only they only use a recruiting agency, like that's a that's a red flag for me, right? Mm-hmm. You have to. Could, why, why can't you recruit? Why doesn't anybody else recruit? Um, if, if you can, I'm not going to be able to get somebody to be convinced to go there. Uh, that's that's certainly not the case. And and when I recruit it internally, I think of um, you know. Uh, the, I did a study at one point in time, and essentially, our highest percentage of incoming new hires came from our own team. And it's because good people know good people. And so they understand and have rapport already built, and there's um, some safety already there. So, like that, that would be a good person here, whether it's geographically, whether it's skill set, whether it's values. So, of course, use your team first. Um, and if, and, and as a leader, yes, you have to take ownership for that because the moment it's all down to one person, well, that's not a good thing. It's not a healthy thing. And, and clearly we're not moving in the same direction to the team. So good advice. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I came up with my, my second recruiter tip to see if it, see if it passes. Recruiter tip number two. Let's hear it. Your test is that you've got to teach the leaders how to be good recruiters or at least how to work within the recruiting process. I remember when I was in corporate and we do the the new leader orientation and eventually we had a, you know, 30 minute training on that the recruiting leader would come in and say, listen, you're going to hire 10 people, 20 people. I don't know this year and next year or whatever. And they would just say, here's like the three things you really, really need to know. And, you know, one of them was make sure your job descriptions are up to date for the roles that turn over the most because they would say um if you have an opening that means you're doing extra work covering and that's not the right time to refresh the rec you know so mm-hmm. have those done ahead of time and another thing they would say is look we operate on a queue standpoint and mm-hmm. you may think we're working with you exclusively on your one role. Like, no, we have like a whole bunch of oh, yeah. in our queue and stuff that leaders never think of. Like mm-hmm. I never think about recruiting until I need someone and I expect them to jump in and like, yep. I have their sole focus. Right. But to say, go, yeah. <laughs> Hey, there's seven steps in the queue, but like these ones are, they go back to you and it'll come to you in the email and you need to review it and then just click like yes or no. And then that will move it forward in the queue. So to say, whenever it hits your queue, it's like, it's waiting on you. So go in there and click. And that's how you get, you get through the recruitment cycle faster that way. And then you get the person you need quicker and you don't lose that good candidate. Cause our process took too long when it's yeah. When, right when it hits your inbox, that's the the point where it, it waits. And so just saying those couple things to the leaders, they're like, oh, that's how I can be good at my part in this whole process. So just that's leadership from the recruiting team to teach the managers how to do their job in the recruiting process that I, I always just appreciated that, you know, recruiter tip is to teach the managers how to be good at the recruiting process as well. I think, yeah, recruiting process is huge. I think I'd be, if I had to give a caveat, like, um, you know, I would agree with all of that. Um, one caveat would be like, yes, absolutely. We need to know the process because timing timing is the biggest killer of, of finding talent or a sale or anything. Um, but also, re- you know, recognizing that, you know, some people may not be incredible recruiters and that's okay. But if, if they recognize that, if I know the process really well and know, know myself and my skill set really well, that will go back to what we talked about earlier. And as long as I can be honest 
and I can put the right people in the right position to win, right? I'm going to be honest. I'm going to do my part of the process. Um, then I can still recruit really great people knowing that I may not be like, you know, someone who is, who is going to be an incredible recruiter. Um, but I know that I'm a really great manager and I know that I'm going to give people a realistic look at what a day to day in the life of this role is going to be. If you can do those things, you'll still recruit fantastic people. Uh, it's just, uh, I think knowing yourself, uh, there as well. So I love those. Those are great tips. Those are awesome. Um, Okay, we've got to wrap up because we're, we're pressed for time here a little bit. I want to be respectful of that. But um, man, this has it's been awesome. There's been a ton to think about. It, leadership, I think, is the just like the heartbeat and the, the core of um, any successful organization, right? If I see a floundering organization, it's typically obvious that either someone is not taking ownership and, and there is not uh, good leadership at s- somewhere uh, in there. Uh, if I see healthy groups that are growing and taking off, because there's really good leaders within that organization, solving problems, developing people, recruiting great people, like other people want to be around it. Um, so I love that and kind of love the mission and kind of what you're attacking there. For for you, kind of looking back at your career, where you are now, entrepreneur, done a lot of different things, written, written a book and um, others books coming out. I know for you, what advice would you give yourself? You know, looking back and saying, okay, um, you know, 20 year old Nathan, um, what, what kind of advice would you give yourself? Man, it's, it's, uh, hard to say exactly, but, um, Adrian, and I wrote a little bit about that in my book stand out, which is geared for young professionals specifically. And so I try to say like all the stuff that took me 10 years to learn, I tried to put it together in a book that you can read in an hour and, and save you five to 10 years right there. But, um, man, the biggest thing is, is just do what you know you can do and have a learner's mindset. Um, because the, the quicker you can learn, the more your world expands. I remember being in accounting and I, all I knew is I don't like it, but I don't know what to do about it. And so I just had to operate within the world that I was in. And, uh, then I, I grew at the pace that I could learn, but I knew it still depends on me. And so, if what I have right now is hustle and sweat equity, that's what I'm going to do. And I'll try to learn along the way. And of course, now I've got to the part to the point in my life where, hey, I'm going to work smarter, not harder. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm getting quicker and faster return on that. But the stuff that I know now, I, I had to gut my way through it. So I, I say, man, whoever you are, wherever you are, be willing to do the work, but you'll, you'll, uh, you'll grow at, at the pace of your ability to learn. I, lo- I love that. I mean, one thing that I love about your story is, is a couple of things, uh, constant themes I've heard throughout our conversation is like one constant learning, right? Um, whether that's going back to school or self-education or learning through other people, but then also with that, um, I've heard your willingness and availability to change when you need it to. So I'm not, I should not be an accountant anymore. I'm going to make a change, yeah. right? Right. Like I, I, I'm not, I'm not set. I'm not, I'm, I'm not interested in corporate America anymore. I need to, I need to make a change. Those things are so difficult. Like I don't want to minimize how hard that is for people because the conversations I have with people every day of like, gosh, should I make a change or something where I may be relatively happy to do something that may be a risk, right? I hear that, um, you know, go, going back to what you talked about earlier, of, uh, Hey, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to really write down uh, and do an evaluation of, um, hey, where am I going? What do I want to do? What do I want to accomplish? So I love that. That's really good. Um, cool. And and I always ask everybody at the end of these podcasts, too, what was there any books in your journey um, that were, I think, just helpful or impactful um, to help you kind of get to where you are today that you'd share? Yeah, I'm just going to put a plug for my book, Stand Out by Nathan sure. Nixon. And I, I summarized a bunch a bunch of other books and thought leaders kind of along the way. But I say, this is the book I wish someone had given to me when I was just in high school because it would have saved me a lot of pain and I would have got where I was trying to go several years sooner. So stand out. Love it. Very cool. We'll make sure that's in the show notes. That's awesome, yeah. man. Well, Nathan, man, thank you so much for your time. Loved hearing the stories. I uh, loved uh, hearing a little bit about um, where you're at. People are interested in leadership in a box. If they're interested in talking with you about, 
you know, leadership um, about, you know, your your books, um, getting in touch with you? How should they do that? Uh, you you can just go to my website, NathanMagnuson.com. Uh, you go to the leadershipinabox.com website. Um, we've got all the programs on the normal topics like accountability and giving feedback and leading change. A couple of our really hot ones right now actually relate to recruiting somewhat. It's the uh, engaging and retaining teams. So like we got to recruit the people we already have and then also the yep. managing your career program. So we're we're equipping and empowering people to ask for what they want in the organization yeah. that they're already in to give us a chance to re-recruit them. And that way we retain them. So we're, mm-hmm. we're doing a ton of work on that, which has been a pleasant surprise because it's making such a big impact. So um, yeah, those are a couple of places you can find me. Wonderful. Very cool. Well, best of luck to you the rest of this year. Uh, enjoyed having you. And uh, thanks for the time, man. Thanks, Adrian. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Recruiting Stories podcast. If you haven't yet, subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Check us out on LinkedIn, Adrian Chapman, and Cover 3 Consulting is our company page. Also check out our website, www.cov3consulting.com. Again, thanks for joining us, and we just simply want to remind you that you can change the world by putting people in a position where they can do the most good, and you do that by recruiting. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.